Right. Hello, everyone. Good morning from Canada. I hope you are doing well. Welcome to this live English lesson. I've got a great lesson lined up for you today. I'm really excited to talk about this story that we're going to be speaking about. We are going to be reading and analyzing the story, The Ant and the Grasshopper, one of Aesop's famous fables. Uh, but before we get started, let me say welcome to my channel. If you are new here, if this is your first time seeing my face, make sure to hit that subscribe button. I would love to have you as a subscriber. We're going to have many opportunities to practice English today. I'm going to ask you lots of questions. I'm going to challenge you to think about this story, uh, about how it relates to what you're doing as an English language learner. So it should be a lot of fun. And let's just get started right away. I'll check on the chat room in a bit. If you're watching though, if you're here live, let me know where you're watching from. Say hello. Don't be shy. So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to read through this story one time, The Ant and the Grasshopper, and then we are going to talk about it. And I'm going to ask you some questions and get you to think about what's going on in this story. All right, so The Ant and the Grasshopper. In a field one summer's day, a grasshopper was hopping about, chirping and singing to its heart's content. An ant passed by, bearing along with great toil an ear of corn he was taking to the nest. Why not come and chat with me, said the grasshopper, instead of toiling and moiling in that way. I am helping to lay up food for the winter, said the ant and recommend you, do, recommend you to do the same. Why bother about winter, said the grasshopper. We have got plenty of food at present. But the ant went on its way and continued its toil. When the winter came, the grasshopper had no food and found itself dying of hunger, while it saw the ants distributing everyday corn and grain from the stores they had collected in the summer. Then the grasshopper knew, it is best to prepare for the days of necessity. Now, we're gonna go through and talk about this paragraph, paragraph by paragraph, but just to begin, let me say that there are many difficult words in this story. Uh, and if you didn't understand that on the first read through, don't beat yourself up. To be honest, a lot of the language in this story is language that you won't need to know for everyday conversation. We're actually going to try and practice switching some of the language into more casual, everyday conversation that you would hear, okay? But let's start. Let's talk about this first paragraph. In a field one summer's day, a grasshopper was hopping about, chirping and singing to its heart's content. An ant passed by, bearing along with great toil, an ear of corn he was taking to the nest. So by the way, that's an ear of corn on the ant's back in the picture. You can see, we call that in English an ear of corn. It's kind of weird, right? It's a weird name for it. So what's happening in this paragraph? We see a grasshopper hopping about, chirping and singing. Everything is fantastic in the grasshopper's life. Nothing is wrong. He's having a great time. Then an ant passes by, bearing along with great toil. Toil just means hard physical labor. That's toil. An ear of corn he was taking to the nest. So the grasshopper's jumping around. He's singing. He's dancing. He's enjoying the day. The ant is struggling with an ear of corn on his back, taking it to the nest. Why not come and chat with me, said the grasshopper, instead of toiling and moiling in that way. My first question for you guys. It's my cat saying hello. How could you rephrase what the grasshopper says in simpler, casual English? Why not come and chat with me? No one really talks like that. You could say that and it would be fine, but in today's world, no one really says that. We're gonna look at how people do communicate, but instead of toiling and moiling in that way, okay, certainly no one talks like that. 
Remember, toiling is working extremely hard. Same with moiling. It's just both of those words deal with hard physical labor. So when you're working really hard, you're toiling away. You can also use toil as a noun as they do in this story. So let me know, how could you rephrase this in simpler, casual English? Imagine that you were talking to your friend. Imagine you're the grasshopper and you're talking to your friend who's working extremely hard and you want to hang out with your friend. Oh, I just gave you a hint there. What would you say to your friend if you wanted them to stop working and to come spend time with you? <laughs> Grace says, toil and moil, all I know is oil. Yeah, well, they certainly rhyme. You can toil away with oil. Lots of people watching. Nigar, hello. Linald from Taiwan. Hung Hyun Tai from Vietnam. Satawat, I'm doing well, my friend. Thanks for watching. RJ from PK, Pakistan, I think. Rosangela from Brazil. Hello, Rosangela. Salem from Moriat, Mauritania. Probably pronouncing that wrong. And Ghazi is here too. Faiza can't, can't watch the video. Uh oh. But how would you say that, you guys? Think about if you were talking to your friend. You wanted your friend to stop working hard and to come spend some time with you. What would you say to your friend? How could we speak about this in casual English? Grace says, let's enjoy, time is limited. Yeah, I would say, how could we rephrase that, Grace? Grace, you could say, let's have some fun, time is limited. Let's have some fun, you only live once. That was a common saying that was popularized by the rapper Drake. Sometimes people just, I, I don't know if they do it anymore or much, but a few years ago, it was very popular to say YOLO, the acronym YOLO, you only live once. So sometimes to express that idea, people would just say YOLO. Shazia says, let's have fun together. Good. Let's have fun together. I was thinking too, you could say, why don't you take a break and come hang out? If I saw my friend working really hard, he looked tired, I might say to him, why don't you take a break? Take a break, stop what you're doing, and come hang out. Hang out is a great phrasal verb to know in English. We use it all the time. It basically means spend time together with friends. I hung out with my friends on Monday. I hung out with my friends last weekend. I'm going to hang out uh, with some of my students later today. You could say, stop working so hard, let's hang out for a bit. A bit just means a short period of time. Okay, good. I am helping to lay up food for the winter, said the ant, and recommend you do the same. Now, we don't really use this phrasal verb, lay up food like that. So this is an example of older English that's not so common anymore. And we're also not like ants, we're people. So we don't have to go and collect a bunch of food for the winter. Fortunately, we have fortunately, if we're fortunate enough, we have grocery stores around us and we can go buy food. So you might say as a person, we go grocery shopping. I'm going to get some food. You might hear someone say, we're going to grab some food. Okay, so these are some common phrases you'll hear when people are speaking about food. Imagine people now, not animals. But anyways, the ant is an ant, so he's preparing for the winter. He's gathering all the food. He has an ear of corn and he's taking it back to his colony to prepare. Why bother about winter, said the grasshopper. We have got plenty of food at present. So question for you guys. How would you describe the grasshopper here? How would you describe his attitude, his response? how he seems to think about the situation. Why bother about winter? Why bother basically means who cares about winter, said the grasshopper. Right now we have plenty of food. 
That's what the grasshopper is saying. So how would you describe that kind of attitude? I've got one new word that I want to teach you, two new words, but perhaps one will be more familiar than the other. But I want to know in your own words. Easy going, says Aisha. <laughs> have a break, have a Kit Kat, says Grace before. Take it easy, says Sun Young Choi. Yeah. <laughs> Satawat says, hey, let's call it a day and hang out together. Good, Satawat. That sounds very natural. If you call it a day, that means you stop working for the day. So maybe at the end of your shift at work, one of the employees could say, hey, let's call it a day. It means let's stop working for the day. Aisha says easy going. Now, easy going, I was just thinking about this. Easy going is usually, it usually carries a positive connotation with it. So it is usually used to describe something positive. He's very easy going. It means he's open to new experiences. He's not hard to deal with. It's used in positive situations. And in this story, I don't know if we, I mean, you could argue that the grasshopper's stance is positive, but easygoing is an interesting way to describe him there. I think it's, you're right about it, but. Grace says a procrastinated person. Grace, we could say someone who procrastinates. Lenald says optimistic. Yeah, nice. Sitawat says reckless. It's funny, hey, to think about what the grasshopper's like, because he's kind of, you could certainly make the argument that he's optimistic. Although I don't know if I would. Satawat says reckless. Yeah, you could certainly make that argument too. And those are very different things. Shazia says careless. Good. It's pretty interesting to see all of the different adjectives you guys are coming up with right now. One word that I wanted to teach you when I'm thinking about the grasshopper, he seems very naive to me. Now, we don't pronounce this nave. It's naive. Naive. Spelling is a little weird, I know. But naive basically means, if you're naive, it means that you don't know something because you're inexperienced. So for example, young children are naive about the dangers of the world. They're naive because they just haven't experienced anything horrible yet in the world. As they grow older, they become less naive. They experience more, they understand more about the world. So the grasshopper seems very naive here. He says, why bother about the winter? Who cares about the winter? We have plenty of food right now. The ant, on the, under, on the other hand, understands that winters are pretty damn horrible and you need to save up food for the winter so that you don't die. The grasshopper doesn't seem to understand that. We could also say that he's overconfident. So maybe he's not naive, maybe he's just overconfident, cocky perhaps. Someone who's cocky in English is overconfident in a way that's kind of arrogant or annoying. So maybe he's not naive, maybe he's just cocky and overconfident. And so what happens to the poor grasshopper? The ant goes on its way continues its hard work. When the winter came, the grasshopper had no food and found itself dying of hunger. While it saw the ants distributing everyday corn and grain from the stores they had collected in the summer. Then the grasshopper knew it is best to prepare for the days of necessity. So the grasshopper learns a horrible lesson once it's already too late, once he's dying of, of hunger. So how would you phrase the moral of this story. What lessons can we learn from this story? Tell me in your own words. It's a very simple story, but I think it comes, it, it teaches a nice lesson. The cold never bothered the hopper anyways. I think that's a quote from uh, Frozen, Grace. Am I right about that? Let me know. <laughs> but tell me what you think about this story. What can we learn?
See, I was just thinking right now, like on this coffee cup, it says, enjoy life to the fullest. I don't know if you can see that right now. Let me switch screens. It says, enjoy life to the fullest. Now, one could make the argument that that is what the grasshopper is trying to do. He's living in the moment, he's hanging out, he's relaxing, he's enjoying life. He looks at the ant and he sees this creature who's struggling and working very hard and in the present moment perhaps not enjoying life as much as the grasshopper is. But what happens later? Well, the grasshopper starves to death and the ant has food and he survives the winter. So how do you enjoy life to the fullest and how do you do it responsibly in a way that makes sense? Shazia says, careless. Grace says, work hard. Oh, I like it. My favorite color. Red is your favorite color then? So one thing that we can learn from this story, and if you guys want to add some more, uh, let me know in the comment section. But one thing that we can certainly learn, or one lesson I think that is present is don't sacrifice the future for the present. That's exactly what the grasshopper does. Don't sacrifice the future for the present. The grasshopper sacrifices the future for the present. The ant sacrifices the present for the future. The grasshopper is enjoying life in the moment. He doesn't think about the future. He says, I want to enjoy life right now. I don't care about the winter. Why worry about the winter? The ant does the exact opposite. He says, no, Things are good right now, so we have to prepare for the future. And I want to ask, when have you sacrificed the present for the future? Or the future for the present, like the grasshopper does? While you guys are answering, while you're typing away, I'll give you some examples here. And these are some examples that all of us can probably relate to. So sometimes you are invited to a party or something that sounds very fun and exciting, but you can't go because you have work the next day. I'm sure that's happened to all of us before. We want to go out with friends, we want to have a great time, but we have some kind of commitment the next day that requires us to be at our best, so we can't go out. So what is that? Well, that's sacrificing the present for the future. You're not doing something that would be enjoyable in the moment so that the future will be better for you. What about this? When have you sacrificed the present for the future or the future for the present? Well, what's this? These are cigarettes whiskey there and donuts. This is the opposite, right? Now this is more complicated because they're all drugs of some sort, but if you're sacrificing sorry. sorry. If you're sacrificing the sorry, I'm all distracted now. If you're sacrificing the future for the present, then what are you doing? You're taking in things that are that might feel good in the moment, that are good for you now, but in the future, they will not be great for you, of course. If you eat donuts all the time, if you stuff your face with unhealthy food, if you drink a lot of alcohol all the time, if you smoke cigarettes, in the future, you will pay for it, just like the grasshopper does in this story. So let me know. So Tawat says, life is unpredictable. Save possessions as many as possible when you have a chance. Yeah, that's another good one, too. I mean, in this case, it. I like what you're saying about life being unpredictable. In this story, it's very predictable, though, right? The ant knows what's going to happen. He knows that the winter is going to come. And I think that's true in life as well. It's predictable in the sense that you know you're going to encounter difficult situations. You may not know what those difficult situations will be, 
but you know that things are going to get pretty bad eventually because that's just how life works, right? So it's predictably horrible in some way, but it's unpredictable in, in the same way too. So I know what you're saying there. Enkem Gallen says, should prepare for the difficult exceptions as if it will the certain. Yeah, so I think you're trying to say the same thing there. You should prepare for the future, for difficult things to happen in the future because you know they will happen, difficult things. One always plan about the future. Yes, one should always plan for the future. We plan for things in English. I have to plan for my big meeting tomorrow. I have to plan for the presentation I have to give at work. I have to plan for next week's live lesson. We plan for things in English. Newton says, never be overconfident and always be prepared for the difficult time because all the days are not the same. You should always save something for a rainy day. Yeah, exactly. Brace yourself for the difficult times. Grace says, I'm still working for it, so I can't say sacrifice working. I don't do party anyway, so it's not sacrifice for me. So not giving up, giving up parties is not a sacrifice for you. But working is. What are you still working for, Grace? Let me ask you that. It's not sacrifice. It's a part of life. Well, sacrifice is certainly a part of life, Shazia, is it not? Life is full of surprises, says Precious Madal Santos. Good. It certainly is. Rosangela says, when I was young, I left of go out with my friends by to study for inside at college. Rosangela, you could say it like this. When I was young, I stayed in. If you stay in, you stay inside your place. I stayed in to study and didn't go out. I didn't go out because I had to study. You could say it in many different ways. I would say it like that, actually. When I was young, I, uh, I didn't go out because I had to study. I didn't go out with my friends because I had to study. Ghazi says, sure, we are working hard in the present for the best future. Yes, I think you're right. Okay, and what about learning English? So all of you guys are learning English. Why are you doing this? I know that it can be fun, it's enjoyable, but it can also be not fun and not enjoyable. You can reach a point in your studies when you feel like you're not progressing, when you feel like you're not learning anything. Um, sometimes you forget vocabulary that you learned a while ago that you spent a lot of time studying and that can be frustrating. Studying English can be an incredibly frustrating process. There are weeks, there are months, there are sometimes even years when you don't feel like you're getting to where you need to be. So why are you doing this? We can think about studying English as sacrificing the present for some future thing. Let me know. <laughs> Elizabeth says, I didn't go out a lot of friends for meeting for passing university test. Yeah, so same thing. I didn't go out with friends because I had a test at school. Exactly. Sacrificing the future for the present are the more difficult ones that we don't want to admit to. But all of us certainly do it, I think. when we are impulsive and we do things for pleasure. <laughs> yeah, perfect, Nitin. I'm skipping ice cream now as I want to enjoy a five-course dinner later. Excellent. Nice work. And I hope you enjoy your five-course dinner. I personally for travel to Canada to learn English. So Ghazi is studying English, working hard, so that later he can travel to Canada and speak English in Canada. 
So sacrificing the present for the future. You're aiming to go to Canada. That's your goal. And keep working hard. Be like the ant, not like the grasshopper, right? And if you're going to come to Canada, I would say that now, or at least in a few weeks, it will be a pretty good time to come because the snow is just melting over here in Calgary. Things are starting to get warmer. There's less ice on the ground, although there's still quite a bit of ice. But I think, fingers crossed, I think that the winter is behind us this year. And it was a very cold winter. Anyone else want to let me know why they're studying and working so hard to learn English? Why they're sacrif- what f- present, what future they're aiming for? Why they're sacrificing the present? Okay, so Shazia says, I'm learning English because it's an international language. It helps us wherever we go. Right, so you're planning for future situations. Wherever you go, you'll be prepared. You'll have English. You'll be able to speak in English. Grace says, it can be a weapon. Today, one of my coordinators said that I have a weapon that no English teachers have. Yeah, I mean, especially if you think about it as a weapon that you have over other competitors, if you're competing for a job, perhaps, that requires English. Yeah, if you know English and other people don't, then that is kind of like a weapon. You're beating your competitors. You have a a leg up, we could say. Elizabeth says, I'm studying English because there are a lot of chances when you speak well in English. You can understand series, music, and it is international English. Yeah, there's certainly a lot more TV shows, movies, and music that you'll be able to understand, for sure. Well, keep it up, Elizabeth. Good for you. Bridget says, hi from Germany. I'm studying to make new friends from all over the world. I'm going to visit the U.S. in May. Very cool. (laughs) Gazi says, of course, when I will get Canada, I meet you, Jacob. Probably I will come to Vancouver. Yeah, Vancouver's pretty beautiful, especially in the summer. I'm in Calgary right now, which is about a one-hour flight or a 12-hour drive because you have to drive through the mountains. But I'm in Calgary right now. Learning for my professional improvement and wide relationships. Leg up, says Grace. Yes, a leg up is when you have an advantage over the competition. Linald, I usually sacrifice sleep to watch dramas all night. Perfect. So there's an example of the opposite, sacrificing the future for the present. You stay up and you watch dramas all night and it might be enjoyable for you in the moment, but then of course later, the next day, you're exhausted, you're tired, you're miserable, you regret having watched all those dramas last night. Maybe, maybe not. Precious Madel Santos says, for me to get a better job, you know, English is a plus. Yeah, so again, a better job. Imagining a better future. Nitin, studying English is fun, but it is going to boost my confidence when I will be traveling around the world. It will open new opportunities for me as well, and it has given me a friend like you. Oh, that's very kind. And I do hope that you are able to travel around eventually and meet new people and experience all sorts of new opportunities and things. Yeah, and Grace, definitely come to Canada in the summer and not the winter. That would be my advice as well. All right, everyone. So that is all that I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this lesson, join Jacob's English Club. It's the best online English club available. What I do is I help people who are... When you're when you're learning a language, It kind of goes like this. You start out and you're going up and up and learning more and more and more. And then eventually you hit a plateau. And what I try to do is I help get people out of that plateau onto the steep side again, progressing towards their goals. When you're in a plateau, things can feel rather boring. You could be bored with your studies. You could be lacking confidence as an English speaker. Everything is not so great when you're here. So join Jacob's English Club. 
check it out. Some of my students are in the chat room right now. And for members of Jacob's English Club, there is a bonus quiz for this lesson that will be available on the on our website later today. So I'll upload that soon. All right, but that is all I have to say, everyone. So I hope you enjoyed that lesson. Take care. Be like the ant and not the grasshopper. <laughs> and I will see all of you next week, the same time. Bye-bye.